on this edition of Metro Focus, we're exploring county culture with visits to Prince George's and Montgomery counties. We'll take you to a few destinations both known and not so well known. We'll take you on a behind the scenes visit to our Landover bus division. And finally, we'll offer you a unique perspective from a rider's point of view. All this and more on this edition of Metro Focus. Hello everyone, we're here today at the Goddard Space Flight Center with Ms. Kristen Metropolis, Program Manager. Thank you, Kristen, for welcoming us here today. Thank you for coming. So we are here in Greenbelt, Maryland, which is definitely transit accessible. It is, yes. And I saw that there's not only the uh, Prince George's County bus system, but the University of Maryland offers public transportation here to the Space Center. Goddard, it's very accessible, so it's, it's such a unique opportunity to see what's really happening in the community and what kind of really amazing science and research that we're doing here. And I think we're kind of a hidden gem. Tries actually have a rocket garden. We do, yes, it's very rare. Not a lot of places have rocket gardens anymore. You know, we're free to the public. We're open Tuesdays through Fridays at 10 to 3, and on the weekends, 12 to 4. So there's always something fun going on. You can check our events page. We always have really interesting events and speakers and things going on. So tell us, when was the Space Center founded? Uh, the Space Center has been here since the early 60s, and the Visitor Center has been here since the late 70s. Wow, so how many visitors on average do you get here at this Visitor Center? We get about 40,000 visitors every year. Well, we get a lot of school children, uh, a lot of groups, mostly uh, fourth and fifth graders, middle mm -hmm. school students, but we get all the way up through uh, high school and college as well. We've just had some really exciting new exhibits open in this past year. We have uh, a great exhibit about the Webb Telescope, which is going to be launching uh, probably in the next two years. It's being built actually right now on center. And so right here, right here on property, right here. That's amazing. So a lot of the school groups that come and have tours, they get to go and see the exhibit here and then they get to go over on center and actually see it being in a clean room. And Goddard is known as the home of Hubble also, isn't it? It is. They've just celebrated their 25th year, and it was uh, designed and built here at Goddard, and it's still operated from here as well. Is it about how many employees work here at the Goddard Space Center? I think it's about nine or 10,000. Some of the brightest and most uh, brilliant minds in the region, I guess. Yes. Right here in Prince George's County. Right here. Our exhibits really show the breadth uh, and depth of our, our missions here at Goddard. So we have everything from you know, how we study the universe and the solar system to earth science and the study of the sun. There was a solarium. It was almost like I got a chance to really see the sun. The exhibit itself is a digital art installation. So really, you go in and you really can feel a connection to it. That is the, the very you know, sun, our sun that's powering this earth, that's keeping us all alive. The first permanent home of it is here, but it's also been shown around the country and internationally. So we've got a lot of hands-on activities. We do um, some really great programs on the weekends for families and children. We do a model rocket launch the first Sunday of every month. Uh, kids can actually build their own rockets and bring them here and launch them. We sell kits in the gift shop. Uh, we also do during the school year, the third Sunday of every month, we have Sunday Experiment, which is a great opportunity for families to come uh, with their children and do hands-on activities. And the theme changes monthly and it's sponsored by an actual mission on center. Sometimes they can meet an astronaut, uh, but they can definitely always meet a scientist or somebody who's actively involved in the mission, which is That's, really That is very great. important. Yeah. Here we go. We're getting in the spacecraft. I'm getting in, I'm sliding in. Yeah, so this is the model of the Gemini. This is awesome. This is tight space here. It is. It's very tiny. I'm ready to, you know, I don't have a seatbelt, but we're going to take off. You better hold on, girl. This is about to get really live here. Here we go. Yeah, here's all the dials. And all the dials. This is really amazing. I can see why the kids really like this. Even tight space. Yeah. <laughs> this is pretty outstanding. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I had a great time here today. Anytime. We're in launch mode, guys. Stand back. <laughs> And here we are at the Prince George's African American Museum located in North Brentwood in Prince George's County. We're visiting with the Executive Director, Mr. John Westbeck. 
Hi, John. How very, are you? Very good to meet you. It's a pleasure to be here at the museum. This is a wonderful jewel located in Prince George's County. That's right. Thanks for coming out. Well, tell us a little bit about the history of this museum. Sure. Uh, the museum is meant to feature the art and culture and history of African Americans in Prince George's County. We've been around since uh, 2010, and we've had about 12 exhibitions since we've been open, and we have four exhibition spaces with a unique experience in each of them. Who are your primary audiences? I mean, it's a free museum, am I correct? It is a free museum. Uh, just tours are for sale and mostly families uh, are our biggest audience and uh, we have a great partnership with Prince George's public school system and we have just under 900 artifacts in our collection that we feature on a rotating basis. So are many of the artists from around the region or strictly in the county? Uh, we try to have ties specifically with Prince George's County but we uh, feature artists uh, from all over. This museum is open not just to the African American community but to everyone, correct? Absolutely. It is, it is open to everyone and our audience is not just African American and it's not just people from Prince George's County. It's something for everybody. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. So the museum is located right along Rhode Island Avenue, so it seems to be ex incredibly transit accessible. I noticed that there are buses that run right in front of the museum. It is very accessible. There's a bus that's right in front, and then the closest metro stop is either West Hyattsville or uh, Rhode Island Avenue. That's a very important fact to point out because as families plan what they can do, the bus is an affordable option and traveling around on a Saturday. And many of our visitors, especially on the weekends, uh, depend on public transportation to get here and we welcome them. Well, we're going to take a tour of some of the exhibits Great. you have here today, so Great. I'm looking forward to it. Are there any special exhibits you think we should pay close attention to? Absolutely. I, I love our patented ingenuity exhibition and it features patents from African American vendors who have specific ties to Prince George's County and also uh, uh, other African American inventors. We have uh, different artifacts that we've collected over the years. This piece, for example, is uh, a series done by artist Curtis Woody. Uh, these are what he calls quilt paintings, where he takes scans of actual slave documents and put, mix them into a collage. Uh, and these slave documents relate directly to um, uh, enslaved people in Prince George's County. This typewriter and typing manual was donated by a woman named by Curtis White and uh, I, I keep this up because it's uh, very indicative of how we collect at the museum. She invited me over to come and look at some, uh, some, some newspapers and when I was at her house I said, well tell me about that typewriter and she told me this wonderful story about how she took typing classes and trained herself and got a job in the federal government and was able to raise her family. And uh, those are really the types of artifacts that we look for, ones with a story behind it. This is a barber apron that was invented by uh, local barber Nathaniel uh, Mathis. He told me a great story where, uh, about inventing this. Is he said that he had to cut someone's hair and he forgot his shears. And so the first thing he did was he touched his chest and he said, well, that's probably where they should have been the whole time. To see his, his actual patent with the patent drawing next to it, uh, gets, to, gets to, you can show kind of what the, the prototype is and what the, the patent looks like, so it goes from idea to, to actuality. And if you had to send one message out there to families that are looking for something to do, something interesting and a little eclectic, what would you say to them about visiting this museum? I would say come to the Prince George's African American Museum. Uh, each exhibition uh, is something different and something new, and I guarantee you'll learn something new about Prince George's County. My name is Andy Shalal. We're standing at Bus Boys and Poet in Hyattsville. This is the Howard Zinn Room. You know, we have seven locations, so we have them throughout the metropolitan area. We have one in Virginia, we have uh, one in Maryland, and we have uh, five in D.C. It's a place, we say, where racial and cultural connections are consciously uplifted. We are a place for everybody. All of our locations have events every single night. Our open mics are world class. People come from all over the world to perform in our open mic programs. We have an open mic program, I think practically every single day of the week. So you can come and uh, look on our website at www.busboysandpoets.com. 
and be able to see all the listing of events. We do author events, we have lots of book talks, we have panel discussions, we deal with issues of race, we deal with issues of gender, we deal with issues of politics. We are the place to go to watch the political returns during the primaries as well as during the elections. It's a great place to gather and to meet people. I think the proximity to a metro station or a bus stop is essential for any business to grow. Uh, people depend on public transportation to get to and from work. Uh, I'd like to see more lines. I'd like to see more accessibility. I'd like to see later lines. Uh, it is absolutely essential for us. We try to, in fact, schedule our hours and our employees around metro hours. We go into neighborhoods and communities that are oftentimes underserved, uh, places that are emerging. For example, Hyattsville here on Route 1 did not have a lot of options. People had to go, uh, you know, wide and far to be able to find a place to sit down to eat. There were no outdoor uh, dining areas. There was no patios. You know, we created one of the largest patios here in the county. We try to be much more organic in our approach to how we develop our business to attract people that have lived there and the people that are coming in. Our first location was located at 14th and V Street Northwest in Washington, D.C. It's in the U Street corridor, of course, a great spot to be there for the type of place we have. It is the crossroads of the civil rights movement, in a sense. You know, the U Street corridor is famed. The SNCC office is across the street from Busboys and Poets, or used to be. Uh, it was a place that was called Black Broadway at one time, where you had the greats of Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston and Duke Ellington and others who used to actually perform and, and live near there. So it's a, it's a place that has a lot of history and a lot of spirit in there, and we try to bring that back. We are an American-type restaurant, but we serve a lot of gluten-free items, a lot of vegan items and vegetarian items. Uh, so you can come with a group of people here and have different tastes and different allergies and different needs and all be able to enjoy a great meal. Uh, so we serve you know, everything from wonderful um, artisan pizzas to great, great entrees like our blackened salmon, which has become world famous now. People write about it everywhere. Uh, and we also have great sandwiches and a cup of coffee. So if you want to just come, uh, drink a cup of coffee and be on your laptop and hang out and write the best novel ever, this is a place for a lot of people to do that too. We get lots of students that come from University of Maryland and uh, in other places from the other universities that are closer to them where they meet their friends there, they do their homework there, they have discussions there, they, uh, they partake in an event there, they buy a book there. That's what we're about. Well, today we're visiting Strathmore with the CEO and President, Mr. Elliot Fanstill. Hi, Elliot. Hi, How welcome to Strathmore. You? This is a wonderful place. Well, it's actually better than we dreamt, dreamt it to be. Well, tell me a little something about Strathmore and the community it serves. This was the Montgomery County Arts Center that never got built until 1981. And then it was just the mansion, which is right next door. So the county bought the mansion, said, start something and let's see how it goes. Well, after 25 years, the county executive and the county council said, let's build the real thing, because everybody had said, why not a concert hall? That time, the Baltimore Symphony showed up and said, we could use a second home. Now that's sound. It's unique. There's no other orchestra in the country that has two full-time homes, so to speak. And the bottom line is that uh, about six, seven years later, we opened February 2005. We also have a music education wing at the other end of the building, because our feeling was, if you don't bring the youth up today in an arts culture, who's going to be in these seats 10 years from now? Well, that's very true. Tell us about some of the things that have happened and what you have on the horizon. So there's a, a wide range of artists. We try not to just be classical or just be popular. Right, uh, right. Diana Ross has played here, which was well, the a one show. And only, yes. Yeah, the one and only, <laughs> clear. Um, and we bring back, you know, the Johnny Mathises and, uh, yeah. and the Bobby McFerrins and so yeah. forth. But we also like to do things which are a little more challenging. If you've got a facility like this, you've got to really take new work and commissioning and new product to the world because there aren't that many of these places.
I knew I had a classical audience, it's yes. Montgomery County, what do you expect? What I didn't take into account was the incredible diversity of our population. So we found we could put Croatian dancers on stage and there's a Croatian audience in the house well, who diverse. we hadn't seen before. That's diversity. It's amazing to see just the change in tonight's audience from tomorrow night's audience based solely on who's on that stage. So tell us about your relationship with Metro. My father was the director of Metro Public Affairs. So you love us. I Listen, you paid my tuition. <laughs> you paid my house expenses. The Metro is Strathmore because we are the only venue, certainly anything of this size, on a Metro site. I mean, we are, you are next door to us. And literally, we built a bridge, a pedestrian bridge, and you literally walk across the street straight into our hall. Convenient, safe, and accessible. So tell us a little bit about the AMP program. 2,000 seats of a concert hall attracts a certain body of people for the most part, the large concert goers, right? We needed a place where you could be cooler, younger, hipper, get a drink, get some food, and listen to great club music. What would you say is the future of Strathmore? We're not gonna build any more of these. <laughs> they're big, they're expensive, uh, they're beautiful, but you don't need a lot more of these. I can tell you exactly what the future is, and we just launched it a year ago. Um, we are roughly in West Montgomery County, which is Rockville Pike 270 corridor. If you go to East Montgomery County, that whole area over there is actually quite different demographically from this side of the county. We are taking Strathmore's assets, it's artists we're going over there, we're doing an asset map of everything that exists that's artistic, meet those people, connect with them, raise their quality of performance up, raise their audiences up, which is what they're desperate for. Teach the people over there that you can have arts too, and we are a cool artistic community, not just the other side of the county. Thank you for allowing us to come here today. Yeah, and I'm ready back. to hit the stage. What about you? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I invite all of you also to come out and visit the Strathmore. There's a lot to do and there's something for everyone. I'd just like to say, I understand this is the 40th birthday for Metro. And since I grew up in a Metro family, let me just say thank you very much, Metro, not only for what you did for me as I was growing up, but what you do every day for so many people in Montgomery County and throughout the region. Happy birthday, Metro. I'm Carol Carrier from Plant Masters. We are a local flower farm from Montgomery County and um, sell our products here at the Montgomery Farm Women's Cooperative Market near the Bethesda Metro Station. So this farm market opened in 1932 um, directly in Montgomery County by the farm women and over the years obviously it's changed somewhat but we still serve a community that has an affluent residential base and then over the years, especially Astor Metro came in, the property values uh, changed so that there were more businesses, restaurants, shops. So this is a respite for people to come and meet their friends, grab their veggies in season, flowers for the table of their home, gifts, baked goods, we have it all here. There's a big movement right now to buy local, buy fresh, support small businesses and family farms and that's one of the great things for this market. We're an incubator for those kind of businesses. The Montgomery Farm Women's Market here in Bethesda is just a couple blocks down the road from the metro station called Bethesda. So it's a great destination spot for people all over the city to come and do some shopping, go to restaurants, movies, um, a lot of people work in the area and they will shop at the farm women's market. We started Plant Masters back when my husband was still in high school. We were high school sweethearts. We both attended the University of Maryland. He got his degree in horticulture. And so this is a family business. We are on a family farm and now we're transitioning to having my son be the next generation to take over the flower business. And obviously, because we're close to Metro, it's meant that we are able to sustain our business over 35 years. So we thank them for that. Having it near a Metro stop has really meant that we can reach a broader audience. We're not limited to just the people in the area. We are a destination now for people all over the city and the surrounding Metro suburbs. And that's made it pretty special to be able to come and service that many people. And because we've been here so long, we have customers that come and see us from all over the city. 
There's restaurants, there's nightlife, and our farm market, which is the place where people come Saturday mornings, Wednesday mornings, Fridays, to come and visit with their friends and pick up the things they need to enhance their life at home. And lots of times people just like to walk through here, I think, just to get a breath of spring in the winter time. Because the color is great. It really is a perks you up. So you've come on a very cold day in winter. Um, it's only about 19 out right now. So as you can imagine, we're a little more limited on some of our product. But as the season goes on, um, we'll be doing more and more cut flowers from our hoop house. We'll start with um, daffodils and campanula, poppy, and you'll find that then we'll move into the flowers that your grandmother used to grow, that everyone loves. Zinnias and lilacs and peonies, all summer long it just goes on and there's a bounty of cut flowers for you to find. Our market as a whole will bring in heirloom tomatoes, um, fresh corn and peaches, all from Maryland or close by, and that will make your um, summer barbecues sing. I'm glad you were able to stop by the Montgomery Farm Women's Cooperative Market today here in Bethesda and hopefully you'll take the metro over and get off at the Bethesda stop and come down a couple blocks and visit us. We'd like to become your friends. My name is Jessica Pitt. I'm the superintendent of bus transportation for Landover Division. I've been at WMATA for almost 20 years. I'll have my 20th anniversary coming up. Well, I have 282 operators. I have six permanent depot clerks. There's five of us in management here. We have two training instructors and a host of mechanics and a mechanical superintendent as well. The Landover Division employees, they are exclusive to this division. They're a different union, so they can't leave here and go operate the train and be a station manager because of the different union that they're under. But other than that, they, they still have the same duties and responsibilities as all the other operators at Bomada. My role as a superintendent is to be here for the employees. I know a lot of management might say, oh, they work for me, but I feel like I work for them. My job is to be here and do whatever I can to make their day go as smooth as possible and encourage them day to day, and I'll do my best to assist any, any way I can. My first job at Metro actually was a bus operator myself. I drove the bus for a few years, and I also became a depot clerk, and then I was a street supervisor, then I was a senior street supervisor, then I was an office manager, then assistant superintendent, now superintendent. So, I can relate to everybody that's under me because I've done all of their jobs. There's nothing they can tell me because I've done it. Not that I can't learn from them, but I, 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 know the, I know the job, I've been there. So when I start my day, I meet with my employees one-on-one. -on -one. And then after that, I go meet with my managers one-on-one -on -one to see if they have any concerns, anything they need me to address, if they just have something they want to talk about. So I make sure I do all of that before I actually come in my office. Even though we have the customers out in the field that we accommodate, my direct customers are my operators and I need them to be happy just as well as the customers outside of WMATA. So that's the best part of the job for me. We also have a maintenance shop here that has another superintendent in charge of that side of the shop. And they have to account for every bus every day. They take them through the service lane to dump the fare boxes, to wash them, to uh, make sure their service, like as far as oil changes and stuff like that, they do preventive maintenance inspection called PMIs. And yeah, they have their own system running over there too. Safety is our number one priority, as everybody knows at WMATA. Nothing ever should compromise safety, not time, not schedule. And I know a lot of times the buses are laden. We can't rush and drive fast because safety comes first. So unfortunately, that is an issue at times. The operators start their day by coming in, and then they have to pull their manifest, which shows what their schedule is for the day, all the trips they're due to run, what time they leave from each end of the line, what time their meal break, it just gives them their rundown for the day. And then they take their manifest and go downstairs to get a bus from the dispatcher, make sure their bus is safe to go out, and they're going out to operate the bus and pick up those customers. Our buses at Landover Division, our day starts at 4.02 a.m. That's the first one that's due out of Landover, it's 4.02, and our last bus comes in about 1.30 a.m. in the morning, so 
it spans throughout the entire day. We're almost 24 hours in the system in a lot of places, but Landover, that's our last bus. The routes that tend to come out of Landover Division, one in particular, our most popular one is the B30. That one runs to the BWI Airport. We have some C buses that go to Six Flags. That's another popular busy route in the summertime. Um, that one gets a lot of ridership. We have extra service for Six Flags too because everybody wants to go to the park during the summer. What I'm most passionate about is people. I really do love people. I love customer service and I try to give it because I expect it. So how can you not be passionate about something that you want? So I try to give it to everybody that I encounter throughout my day. Hi there, my name is Brianne Berger. I live with my husband and my daughter here in Washington, D.C., and we have three dogs as well. I'm a federal government employee currently. My specific field of work is disability affairs. Make sure there's equal access to the workplace, equal access for education. I also was appointed for the WMATA. Accessibility Advisory Council. And that council meets monthly. They have a select group of people from Maryland, D.C. and Virginia who are Metro system users and people with disabilities, whether it's mobility, wheelchair users, people who are blind or low vision, deaf, hard of hearing, all of that. We have people represented on the council. And we advise WMATA how to make the metro system more accessible for people with disabilities. So my role on the council is to really advocate for, like I said, written communication and visual communication for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, any of the customers who fall in that category. Most days there's no problem with the metro. I can get where I'm going easily, just a regular commute for a regular rider. But the days where there is uh, some kind of breakdown or delay or anything like that, especially if there's single tracking, I get on a train and all of a sudden it's going the opposite way of, that I expected. And I see people you know, moving over and I don't know why people are making those decisions on the platform because I don't have that information. You know, most of it comes over public announcement systems and that goes right over my head because I can't hear. So communication is very, very important. Here in Washington, D.C., there's a very large deaf and hard of hearing community. And I think people don't realize maybe that there are that many deaf people using the system and people who are affected by the same communication needs that I have. So other passengers talking to that point, Obviously, if you're deaf, it's what's called a hidden disability. People don't look at me and know I'm deaf. And so often passengers just assume I'm a person who can hear unless they see something like if uh, they can see I'm using a hearing aid or if I'm signing with someone else who's deaf, then they, they under realize that. But for me, it's a little bit of a challenge because the passengers don't really help out in terms of information. And so sometimes, again, if people are leaving the train or something, I'm trying to figure out, am I supposed to be following everyone? What's going on? So I grew up in New York City, and then I lived in Boston. So I have really only lived in urban environments, and I'm very used to commuting via public transportation. I don't drive much because you're gonna drive around looking for parking. I mean, driving in the city, it's impossible to park in DC. And where I live right now, there is absolutely no parking. So it's very important to me to have access. If you don't have a car, it's really important to be able to use the Metro. On the next edition of Metro Focus, we're in the District of Columbia, exploring destinations both old and new.